Mike Bellman. Welcome back to Bammer and Me. My guest today is Zestan Kazmamitov, uh, who is a 30-year-old Kyrgyzstani now living in Berlin. And this is part two of our interview series with him. Uh, in the first one, we discussed his growing up in Kyrgyzstan, what countries like, particularly for a would-be LGBTQ individual, is coming out. Uh, the reaction that engendered and the violence that ensued and how he ended up having to relocate out of his country for safety, but still goes back uh, frequently and is very active in LGBTQ rights in Kyrgyzstan. Today's episode is, uh, for my mind, uh, going to be even more exciting. And I look forward to sharing with you how he's been using his platform to promote LGBTQ rights progress inside his country um, beyond just making speeches and writing articles, et cetera, and coming out, which was at some personal risk. Welcome to part two of our interview, Destan. Hi, thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, I guess the way we should start this segment is to help our listeners understand how you first started to use your platform to make LGBTQ rights in Kyrgyzstan more visible both there and outside of the country. And you did that in 2017 when you got the idea to ride your bicycle by yourself from Kyrgyzstan to Germany, which is a distance, if I'm not mistaken, of about 10,000 kilometers, 6,500 6, miles. Sure. I, I was in Europe, and from here, I wanted to still uh, do something for LGBT movement in uh, Central Asia, not only in Kyrgyzstan. Um, uh, but I wanted to shift a bit of my focus because previously I was a lot in media and I talked about uh, the problems that we face as LGBT communities like hate, violence, um, discrimination. I personally faced a lot of it. And of course, it's a uh, reflect our lives. Yeah. But I also wanted to say, despite that, we can do cool things, despite the, that we continue to uh, to leave, yeah, to to fight for our rights, to do yeah things that are important to to, to the society. Yeah. So maybe it would be fair to say you wanted to focus on the more positive access aspects of being LGBTQ than just the negative resistance to it. Exactly. So that I wanted that. In the media landscape, there were more uh, positive uh, reports about us. Yeah, not only that we are victims, but also heroes. Yeah, that was my message, and uh, that's why I started to come up with different ideas. And I thought of the idea of cycling uh, from Bishkek to Berlin. I was in one of the probably first people also in the cycling community in Bishkek. It's also like a rather recent phenomenon uh, that uh, young people started to do uh, longer cycling trips in Kyrgyzstan, but as well as uh, push uh, for um, more uh, friendly cycling infrastructure in Bishkek, which was not existent. So. Uh, during my time there. Yeah, so cycling was not only a mean of transportation for me in Bishkek, but uh, also I was actively involved in it, yeah. Uh, I saw actually a lot of people who were cycling through Kyrgyzstan. Most of them were from the Western Europe. And I was quite fascinated by their stories. And I was also always asking myself, why? There is no one from Kyrgyzstan who does the same. And I was asking that question up until the, to the point, why am I not doing it? <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then finally, when I moved to Germany, I, I had enough um, time and uh, resources, even though in, in the end it turned out to be a very cheap uh, adventure. Yeah, less than 1,000 euros or 1,200 US dollars. I paid for the whole trip, including food, for three months. Yeah. It's, How did uh, you manage so inexpensively three months of 
living and traveling? Um, okay, so for the means of transportation, I didn't need to pay much. I mean, I had already a bike. I just need to um, okay, I need to repair it once in Georgia. Um, but uh, the food was quite inexpensive in all those countries. And um, sometimes I even cooked myself. I had uh, cooking utensils with me. And I also had a tent with me. Oh, you t- I was going to ask you about accommodation. You stayed in a tent. Yeah, yeah. but not again, uh, because while you're cycle, you sweat a lot. Yeah. It was summer, it was hot. And um, I was cycling through desert-like landscapes or uh, also like through the steps. That's why I needed sometimes the first time to <laughs> to uh, to shower, to have a shower, and uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, most most of the time. I so was. so, what was the outcome? How long did it take? It took uh, almost three months, less than the three months. Uh, it was quite stressful, by the way. Uh, I regret that I didn't have more time for that because I had to come back to to work and studies in Germany. Yeah, and I, I had only those three months, unfortunately. So basically, you, you raced and pushed to, to do it in that amount of time. Yes, and that was problematic because in some cities, I was only one night, and I uh, couldn't see things that I wanted to see or do, like side trips. Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I... Like unfortunate, I had those. I had those three months only, but it still was an amazing experience. Even though it was quite stressful in the way that I had, I was always pushing myself to do it faster. And Basically, as I understand it, while you accomplished your goal of completing the trip, and I believe you intended to focus attention both on LGBT rights in Kyrgyzstan, but also. You met other LGBTQ people while traveling, and you'd hope to learn their stories and focus on them as well. That wasn't as successful. Is that correct? Exactly. Partially, it was because of limited time, mm-hmm. because in uh, certain cities, I was only one day, so to say, and I had to organize the meetings with the local uh, LGBT activists, for instance, or people I know from LGBT communities. And that was hard because... I was telling them, okay, I have only this evening. Let's meet. And sometimes, yeah, unfortunately, they uh, they were not that flexible. Uh, but I, st- I was still able to meet uh, activists on the way. And um, my hope was to tell their stories, to tell, of course, the whole adventure on the way to, sh- to show people how it is to be gay. Uh, yeah, in different countries. But in the end, and not surprisingly, because you had no experience at that time with public relations communication, you didn't really have the network to generate the kind of attention and visibility that you had hoped for. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. So I didn't have contacts to journalists, for instance, or how to do the whole work around, uh, let's say, visibility in media. And even though there there was like for instance a Russian uh, article so about me, they outreach outreach to me, uh, and there was a lot of uh, uh, attention to that on social media on my social media. Like uh, of course, uh, people were congratulating, writing personally to me. But unfortunately, it didn't turn out uh, to be as well as I planned. Yeah, I wanted to. But the silver lining of the cloud is that it was a staging ground, a, a training, if you will, for what would come next, where you learn the importance of having those contacts, the need to have a website that would have focused attention on it, et cetera, right? Exactly, yeah. So I uh, learned lessons so to yeah. from the trip, definitely. So that leads us to the focus of this, main focus of this interview, which is how you took something that was a part of your makeup and your personality and your activity and developed it into a larger platform for LGBTQ rights in Kyrgyzstan. And that is the whole notion of mountain climbing or mountaineering. 
Uh, and for those listening who aren't aware, Kyrgyzstan is an extremely mountainous country. And historically, if I understand correctly, it was a country of nomadic tribes. And when they were invaded in the course of their lives by neighbors attempting to take over territory or to rob them, they would escape into the mountains, which were a secluded hiding place. And so it's it's part of the national psyche. Mountain mountain climbing is, uh, a, for lack of a better word, the football of Kyrgyzstan um, and the big sport. And it's also, for someone like you, a retreat for safety when you were experiencing what you did during your early activist days. Do you want to describe how important the mountains were to you when you were first coming out publicly? Mountains was uh, that heaven, so to say, um, um, because I was able to uh, escape from the town, uh, from the city, and to uh, be alone by myself with causal friends and um, to um, to reflect upon what uh, what is happening around me to fight against my burnout um, uh, and as an activist of course you face um, a lot of psychological trauma and yeah mm, mountains were some sort of like a therapy for me and for my uh, psychological well-being, so to say. So basically, uh, your country regards mountains in that kind of retreat, escape, safe haven way, and you personally had the same experience because of everything you were going through. Exactly, yeah. And and, and historically, uh, mountains are not only safe haven for the nation, like when they experienced uh, yeah, wars with other nations, but... It was literally food for people, yeah? So those nomadic uh, tribes were going up in the summer to so-called jailos. It's uh, high altitude pastures and went down to lowlands again in uh, in winter. And why, why did they go up during the summer? Uh, because of the uh, uh, pa uh, pa pastures. Oh, the pastures, uh, past yeah. Pastures, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, uh, you, so mean, you mean for, gra for gra grazing their animals, you mean, like sheep or whatever? Exactly. They were grazing animals with the finest grass ever you can find. Right. And, uh, yeah, so it, it was not only a shelter for them, but uh, also basically where, the place where they found food. So what happened next is you married your passion and your the importance that mountain climbing occupied in your life with your passion for LGBTQ rights activism. And do you want to tell us how that idea happened and what you did with it? Uh, during the cycling trip to Germany, I met a very good friend of mine from Kazakhstan, and she told me about Seven Summits a program for mountaineers. It's basically uh, conquering the highest mountains of each continent, including Everest, yeah. And uh, I was really fascinated by the idea. And she told me also about a story of a, of a, a guy in uh, Kazakhstan who was uh, trying to do that um, for himself personally, yeah, not as a as a part of any like campaign or. And is this the guy you told me about who's extremely wealthy? Uh, that's another guy who started okay. also <laughs> later from Kyrgyzstan, from a right. homeland. Right. Uh, yeah. Again, just yeah, extremely wealthy, and he tries to do the the same mountains. Yeah. Now he has the same um, uh, number of mountains as me. Yeah, he has one uh, advantage. Uh, it's re really rich. Uh, yeah, but even if I'm second, doesn't matter. Like I'm doing it for uh, for our visibility. Yeah. There will be. So, so, so to um, clarify, mm -hmm. Seven Summits is a, a challenge that has been attempted by many and only completed, if I understand, by a couple of thousand people or so in, in history. Mm -hmm. And it involves climbing the highest peak in each of the seven continents around the world. 
But in reality, it's not only seven summits, if I understand right, it's nine summits, because the border of Europe versus Asia is in some dispute. And so there are actually two peaks within what one might call Europe. One is Mont Blanc in Switzerland, and the other one is the peak in Chechnya that I believe you climbed. Um, is that correct? It's close to Chechnya, yeah. Um, okay. Mount, Mount Elbrus uh, in Caucasus, yeah. Right. In the, in, Caucasus, in the Caucasus of Russia. And uh, the other and final ninth peak uh, is in what is known as Oceania, the, the ocean, oceanic territories of the world that are not part of continents. So in order to complete the seven summits successfully, you have to complete nine, not seven. And um, so you got the idea of doing what? I thought, this is great. I... Um was a rock climber myself in Kyrgyzstan yeah. and uh, back then as um, I was living there and I thought I could connect those two passions my LGBT activism and mountaineering and wave uh, rainbow flags on the highest mountains of the world and I realized that for instance on some mountains like Mont Blanc there was no rainbow flag waved at all before us. Uh, and uh, No flags waved by whom? From anyone. There was no rainbow flag on the top of Mont Blanc. Oh, uh, wow. The mountain of Western Europe. So mm -hmm. we did the, uh, um, the first mm -hmm. as a group. And uh, yes, and I felt like this would be a great way also for our societies in Central Asia and in, in Russia to show uh, that our LGBT communities are very diverse and that there are also mountaineers among us. And it will be also a big deal for Central Asia because, again, there are not so many mountaineers uh, and there are not so many um, people who are trying to do seven summits, uh, complete this program. So. Um, hopefully, if I will finish uh, all seven summits, um, there will be a huge resonance uh, in, in Central Asia, not only in... So why don't you tell us um, how many people are on your team, what the composition is like, uh, and how many mountains of those... No are you going to do nine or seven? I uh, will do... Uh, sorry, nine. Yeah. Okay. How many, how many of those nine you've accomplished so far you uh, referred to it earlier but i don't know that it was clear for the audience so um in the beginning um i started with the mountain of uh Elbrus in russia which was one of the most difficult mountains but not because of the technicality yeah? uh, it's it's not the technically difficult mountain but uh uh, but because of homophobia in Russia, it it it, uh, it is a mountain that is close to Chechnya, where gay people like us are tortured and killed by the police. And Elbrus itself was in uh, kabardino balkaria uh, part of Russia, which is again very conservative, and uh, they have. All sort of cases of violence against LGBT. What's the name of the area people. again? Kabardina Bokari. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, and on our way to Russia, um, on the border with Georgia, we were stopped by uh, the FSB. It's the um, Secret See? Services of Russia. They um, interrogated us. Um, we were there for more than five hours um, in total. Um, they probably um, Googled me in advance, yeah, because the, per the questions they posed were very personal and kind of in a um, uh, not friendly at all. And, uh, we're mentioning, for instance, traditional values, or um, yeah, uh, my attitude towards Putin, 
my um, towards what Putin to to the president of Russia. Oh, Putin, yes. Uh, and the uh, they um, also took the email email codes of our phones in order to probably track us after that. Uh, yeah, and uh, I was also super concerned um, because when I saw that person from uh, the FSB, uh, I immediately deleted all information on my phone, including like, I don't know, nude pictures or anything that can incriminate me, like, so to say. Yeah, so it, it was very, very uh, hard experience. I mean, like, I was, I, I was frightened. Yeah. Uh, did what, you think? Did you think you might be in prison? I was thinking that yeah, something could happen to us in a way that they will, uh yeah, uh, up until torture or I don't know, yeah. And they could make up a story that was not true about what happened to you when in reality they were responsible for it. Exactly, yeah. So I was really worried, but we were let in still because, I mean, what could they do? I mean, uh, from the perspective of the war, we didn't breach anything. Like, I mean, there's, of course, this propaganda war too, but uh, I mean, there at the border, we didn't do anything. Like, yeah. Uh, they could incriminate us. So they let us in. Um, it was a, quite a relief for us, but still we were super concerned because of the, uh, we had a guide, a local guide. We were a bit concerned of him, what kind of reaction we will get from him on top of the uh, eight bros. And would they, would, they, would he tell that others, yeah, um, and how are we going to react to that? But I was very worried uh, about this trip. Uh, but in the end, we managed it. And actually, on the day of uh, ascending at the mountain, it was a snowstorm. It was a very hard uh, mountaineering trip, physically, because of, of, of the storm in the beginning uh, that stopped. At, I think around five, six in the morning. Basically, uh, we were w walking very slowly because we could not. We were, uh, because of the wind, we were bending down. Uh, it was terrible. But in the end, we reached the top. And I was so proud. Stefan, who was also, um, uh, who went with me this time, uh, he cried on top of the mountain and i i was uh, i don't of course he cried because of the happiness and i was also super happy and proud of us that we in the end reached the summit despite the snowstorm despite the, the all the troubles we faced uh, uh, but i i was still worried uh, about the reaction of the guide about the Trip down back to the uh, the civilization. Who is Stefan? One of your team? Yeah, he's uh, still on the team, and he did. I did all the mountains, and two others who did all the mountains except one. Yeah, and Stefan is one of them. And, uh, and so, if I understand correctly, there are nine people on the team, but not all nine necessarily go each time. Exactly, yeah. No, and, and now we are nine people, so we started three of us, Stefan and Smartin and me, and now there are nine people, yeah. But it, does, it doesn't necessarily mean that all nine right. uh, ascend every mountain. And of your team, um, two of them are Kyrgyzstani. Uh, yes, uh, and yeah. of and of the nine who don't all go on every mountain, but of the mm -hmm. team of nine, eight of them are queer, and one is an ally. Exactly. Right. So, uh, first, let me let everyone know that you set up a five hundred one c three nonprofit status for this group, which is called PinkSummits dot com. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if anybody wants to contribute, because clearly the cost of sending 
nine of the highest peaks in the world with nine people or so is not minuscule. Um, so you're constantly having to raise funds. Uh, can they go to pinksummits.com and contribute there, or is there another way they should do that? Yeah, there is a button on top um, when um, people go onto the website of pinksummits.com. And uh, the thing is that the funds, they go only, not only the uh, common uh, expenditures like hosting of the website, uh, the um, printing things, uh, common um, equipment, group equipment, but also to LGBT initiatives uh, in um, Kyrgyzstan and other places. Like, for instance, this year, I did a uh, um, hiking workshop, uh, and there were mm, around 50 people who came. And that was amazing. Like, it was like, a way to celebrate for uh, LGBT communities. Yeah, we don't have opportunity to have a pride in Kyrgyzstan, but right. there was some sort of a pride yeah, in the mountains. For... And this was hiking or mountain cl uh, climbing the 50 it was. It was rather a hiking event with big, small picnic, with uh, games and right. uh, uh, photo shooting. Yeah, so uh, it was a great event. Yeah, um, and next year we're, we, will, we will do a workshop on rock climbing outside. So basically the fundraising is not only for the expeditions, it's also for LGBTQ rights generally in Kyrgyzstan. Is that correct? Exactly, yeah. Okay. And How much would you say the cost of nine people ascending a mountain like the one in Russia is? That just just that expedition, equipment, meals, accommodation, travel to get there. One mountain, what does it cost? Uh, thanks to my um, lang like language skills, I would say I speak Russian, of course. Right. Uh, I could, uh, uh, yeah, um, make prices more, more affordable, so to you, say. You were able but, to negotiate? Yeah, we got a big discount. But uh, it's expensive. So, like eyebrows, for instance, like if you pay normal, it would be more than two thousand US dollars. Um, so for what? For all the costs, including two thousand. Uh, two thousand dollars sounds like almost nothing to me. Yeah, but it's um, yeah, but it's like the. Of course, you can even pay more if you have, want to have luxury. Right. I don't know, uh, tent and things right. like that. That's yeah, the the bare minimum that you have to pay. But some other mountains that um, are coming later mm -hmm. are much more expensive. So I we actually started in the way that we uh, start from the le least expensive mountain. So you've done Mont Blanc in Switzerland, the mountain Aral, is it in uh, Russia? Uh, you've and you've done two others. Which two are those? So I did Elbrus in Russia, the highest mountain of Europe, Krasushko in Australia, uh, which is um, not that high, but quite beautiful uh, over there. Uh, I had really good time hiking over there. Kilimanjaro in Africa and Mont Blanc, uh, the highest mountain of So Africa. for example, just the cost of getting to Antarctica when you want to climb that peak, just nine flights for people to Antarctica is not going to be cheap, right? The Antarctica is one of the most expensive right. uh, expeditions. It's just around 25,000, right. if not more. Now, I know you've also been getting publicity, thankfully, for this, because it's a pretty uh, unique and commendable effort. Uh, I've seen uh, coverage of you in Gay Cities, in Queer Tea, in the Toll Road blog, and in Instinct Magazine. I'm sure there are others. So as you get closer to the finish of this, which I believe is what, is it going to take you four or five more years? What's your plan? Uh, our plan that we will finish it with the um, ascending of Mount Everest in 2026, uh, in five years. Mm, but it's not the end, but it's actually the beginning because uh, 
there are many plans to do uh, mountains in Central Asia, right. as I said. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's more to it. Yeah. But from the seven summits or nine summits, right. we are planning to finish in 2026. And of course, COVID hasn't done you any favors, huh? I, I'm sure it delayed you a bit. Exactly, yeah. So we were planning to do Mont Blanc last year, but because of uh, COVID, we had to postpone it this year. Do you think that the scaling of these summits by a, a, basically an all-queer group and with a couple of the Kyrgyzstani representatives, when I don't believe there have been any Kyrgyzstanis who've yet achieved this feat, do you have hopes and expectations that if if you do this, particularly if you did it ahead of the very rich guy, but even if you don't, will help impact in a positive way the perception of LGBTQ people inside Kyrgyzstan? Oh, definitely. It already had a huge impact on, uh, on uh, the perception of LGBT. So I was, of course, every time when I come back to Kyrgyzstan, um, I tell that to people what we are doing, and people um, got get inspired by that. Yeah, so um, uh, like, and as an example, there was an uh, an article about us in um, in Russian, and there were like thousands of comments under it, and you could read how much of. Uh, inspiration is in there, how many people are excited. So uh, it's already happening. And I got a lot of also messages personally. And I believe in the end of the uh, campaign, yeah, it, it will be just a blast, it's definitely in Central Asia. But again, it's also important, not only for Central Asia, but internationally, I believe. I have no doubt it's going to instill pride in LGBTQ people in your country, if you manage this, they they can point to it. They can look at it as an example of what we can do. My curiosity is if not the most conservative religious people, because they will never give us a chance. But if the, the middle, the silent middle, that is moderately religious but not excessively so, mm -hmm. if they see this happen, are they going to think, "Oh, wow"? I didn't realize that LGBTQ people had that amount of stamina, that courage, that tenacity to do something like this. My opinion of them in general is improved. Exactly, because we're also fighting God, uh, against the myth uh, about, in, uh, like, for instance, in Kyrgyzstan, many people think that gay men are rather people who are not interested in sports and definitely not in mountaineering. Right. And that's, yeah, of course, will challenge those people. Uh, and the other thing I think it's, it, it, which is important to mention is that mountaineering is considered to be very, yeah, I would say masculine sport or a sport that is connected to race taken, um, stamina, things like that, that are unfortunately not um, associated with uh, LGBT communities. And through this campaign, we are uh, showing that LGBT communities are super diverse. And there are also, for instance, mountaineers am amongst us. Yeah. And also for uh, Central Asia, it's also a very important message. Yeah. And as a representative of Central Asia, I show that we have a fantastic nature. I always tell that. Uh, that I try to um, bring in more tourism into Central Asia and uh, to show that, yeah, that, uh, yeah, we have our problems, but we are an amazing place to, to visit. That will also make clear that it's safe for LGBTQ people to travel there, you know, if assuming things continue in the, the current path, right? Exactly, yeah. So, um, like in a recent interview in Kyrgyzstan, I told uh, the importance of human rights for um, for tourism in Kyrgyzstan. I said, if we can't uh, make the country safe for every person who comes as a tourist, then 
the 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 tourism will die out. Yeah, so there will be not so many people who come. To the it's country. it's interesting. We have a parallel in the U.S. and in my life to what you're doing and the impact you hope you will have by doing it. Uh, I grew up in a conservative southern part of the United States. I was closeted uh, at that time. Homosexuality was not acceptable. You could lose your job, be kicked out of your family, be put in a mental institution and given shock treatments. Um, so you hit it if you felt you might be gay. And I was, I played sports because that was the only way you avoided getting called names. And I learned to love sports, but I didn't think there were any people like me who were gay, masculine, unaffected. And again, no disrespect to those who conform to the stereotypes, but all I saw were the stereotypical images, and I didn't relate. I didn't identify with them. And then when I left, I played college sports. And when I left and went into the world with my first job, I was miserable because I couldn't be myself, even though I didn't yet know who that was. And on my way to work one day, I passed a newsstand in Washington, D.C. in 1975. And I saw an article in a, the local newspaper an interview with a former NFL National Football League professional football player. And wow. he, he came out. And that challenged the, the perceptions of gay men who were thought to be weak, effeminate, unable to compete, certainly not in a team sport like football, which was the nat national sports religion, like mountain climbing is in Kyrgyzstan. And when I saw that article, it made me, oh, my God, maybe I'm gay. I was trying to say that I wasn't. There's a jock, he's gay, maybe that means I am. I wrote him a letter, care of the newspaper. They forwarded it. He looked up my number, he called me up, he invited me out for drinks, and 45 years later, we're still close, he's always been a mentor. He wrote a book in 1977, The Day of Cope Story, which was a bestseller on the New York Times, and he became somewhat of a gay spokesman, unofficially. And um, that book is now out of print because not a lot of emphasis is placed on gay history by a lot of people. But he is an early hero that we should be looking to. Our younger people should know of him. So we're going to be reissuing this book for Dave, about Dave, in 2022. But the similarity and the parallel and the reason I'm mentioning it is that Dave's experience challenged every idea that was common across the U.S. in 1975 about gay men. The fact that he had competitively played for nine years as a running back on some very, you know, successful uh, NFL pro teams meant that gay men were everywhere and that we were as masculine as anyone else when we hadn't been thought to be. And so my hope and yours, as I understand it, is that what you're doing will end up having the same effect on the average person in your country to go, oh, my God, they're just like us. In fact, I don't know who's gay and who's not by looking at it. And hopefully that then leads to an acceptance of LGBTQ rights in Kyrgyzstan the way they are generally here. Um, so that's, is that a fair comparison, do you think? Yes, and I hope that there's going to be a domino effect as happened with my um, coming out story, yeah, that there are more um, people in Kyrgyzstan now who come out after me. And I hope that in the same way will happen with sports, for instance, in Kyrgyzstan, or people who are famous in Central Asia, that they will have enough power to um, come out. That's my hope. Besides your activism in general and your mountain climbing activism, do you have any other goals? What do you think lies ahead for you, living in Germany as an emigre, but who returns home regularly? Of course, uh, Pink Summit plays a huge role now in my life. Um, but um, I plan to build a family here in uh, Germany um, to come to my, so to say, uh, one day to my normal family routine um, to hopefully maybe even uh, to have kids. Uh, so are you hoping that one day you'll be able to 
we'll be able to reach the point where your activism is no longer necessary? That that is definitely yeah. That's my dream. But of course, I yeah. I also understand that uh, probably it needs more time, especially in Kyrgyzstan, that uh, we come to the point when um, we can weave openly and freely. Uh, I can see here in Europe from its history as well that just under hundred years, yeah. People like us were exterminated in the uh, in the Nazi camps. So I believe there is a lot of potential in Central Asia for for a change, for social changes, and um, yeah, I'm quite optimistic about it. I, um, as you know, I've introduced you to someone else um, who is Turkmenistani, and without going into details, over the course of a year and a half, and with the help of an organization called Rainbow Railroad in Toronto, we were able to get him out of uh, trouble and and the the risk he lived in in a country where he had been imprisoned and beaten for being gay um, and tortured uh, to a safe place in Europe, like you have gotten to. And my hope is to bring both of you and Human Rights Watch and Rainbow Railroad on a Zoom call where we have a panel discussion on LGBTQ rights in Central Asia in general. Um, so that's something I'll keep you and our audience posted on. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring about. My final question for you is, do your parents have any idea of how much you've accomplished? And how do they feel about it now? Uh, they're proud of me, definitely. And they tell me that, that they love me. And um, they say always to me that I am I was always a kid out of this world. I didn't, I, I, I never fit into the society, so to say. Yeah, they, my mom was telling me that I'm an alien. Maybe she's right in a way. Um, but I think the difference before and after my coming out uh, is that before they were showing that pride openly and publicly, yeah, and telling all the guests and relatives how great our son is, <laughs> how smart, I don't know, whatever, uh, getting good uh, grades at school and stuff like that. But now they became more silent about my accomplishments. Well, um, it's tough in a country like that, you know, because yeah. only some people are going to really appreciate it and respond positively at this early stage, right? Yeah, the, the, that's one of the explanations. Uh, yeah. But in in any case, uh, I know that they they love me and they're proud of me, and they believe in the things that I do. And of it's, course, they're also super concerned about the mountains as parents. Sure. Uh, uh, they, my mom, for instance, is afraid when every time when I go into expedition, but but uh, yeah, but they believe in me. And Your use of the word "you being an alien" made me think of a pun. You are alienating Kyrgyzstan, and by that I mean you are turning them all into aliens slowly. <laughs> um, I'm really so glad to have had the opportunity to get to know you personally, but also to share that knowledge of you with the world. I think what you're doing is amazing. Um, you know, it takes people willing to stand up and go against the crowd in really oftentimes unsafe or dangerous conditions to accomplish the change that you're aiming for and, and seem on a path to, to achieve. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for everything you're doing. Uh, and thanks for making yourself available today. Uh, thank you for also a lot for giving this opportunity to share our stories and giving the voices like me, people like me, because uh, without you, it will be, uh, there will be less visibility yeah, for, for us. And uh, thanks to every person, every ally for making this social change possible, this visibility possible.
The podcast you've been listening to is produced by Mike Balaban and Tom Walker, recorded and researched by Mike Balaban, with editing and music from Henry Leigh.